Hey folks, I uh, just want to do a quick intro for this one. Um, this is an interview with uh, Sarah Burrell from the podcast uh, Unmaking Saskatchewan. And uh, I really enjoyed this interview. It's talking about Saskatchewan, my home province, a uh, place where I've lived my whole life. <laughs> um, and where the politics are often very frustrating. Uh, as a leftist, uh, an anarchist in Saskatchewan, it can be really, really kind of tough to see everybody with their very, very conservative and backwards opinions about pretty much everything. And yes, I do think conservatives are backwards. I don't think that should be even uh, controversial to say. Um, although I'm sure conservatives would think that that is controversial, but I, I think it's based on the facts. Our provincial history and our provincial government uh, tend to lean into some pretty harmful ideas. And uh, yeah, I think that we cover that pretty good. And uh, and uh, uh, Sarah's podcast, Unmaking Saskatchewan, is a, a valuable resource for anyone who wants to know the history of Saskatchewan from a anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist uh, perspective. I put this uh, ahead of two other interviews. I wanted to get this one out. Um, I apologize to uh, Brentley and uh, uh, Chris Watson, who had to get bumped so that, <laughs> so that this and uh, my next interview could go ahead of them. But I think really... As much as I enjoy talking to Brentley and Chris, I think that uh, uh, Sarah and my next interview is with Tori uh, Douglas from the White Homework Podcast. I think that these two interviews really provide a lot of information and, and are really valuable. And I mean, not to be too uh, woke about it, I guess, quote unquote woke about it. But uh, I think it is valuable to listen to women and women of color uh, before the same old white dudes that, <laughs> that we listen to 99% of the time. Uh, part of what I'm doing this show for is to expand the way that uh, people view the world. And we might not always get that from talking to other white dudes, cis white dudes. <clears throat> so... With that said, before I want to uh, before I send you over to the interview, I just want to say uh, thank you for supporting the show and a huge thank you to everyone who supports my work. If you would like to support this project, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist and sign up for $1 per month uh, to get access to a special patron pa chat room on the Discord server, as well as extra long videos, uh, and occasional early access, and of course my uh, heartfelt thanks. You can donate one time at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. And if you can't afford to do that, then share the show and uh, give it a thumbs up on a YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And I think that's everything. On to the interview. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, a podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Sarah Burrell from Unmaking Saskatchewan. <laughs> so for uh, Saskatchewan folks, this is going to be a local podcast. And for those of you outside of uh, Saskatchewan, maybe you can learn a little bit about us. <laughs> so thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about the show and uh, to have a little bit of a conversation. Yeah, for sure. So I guess a good place to start is uh, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, so I was born and raised in Saskatchewan. Uh, I am, I'm not working as a journalist right now, but I have worked as a journalist and an editor in the past. Uh, a lot of my work has looked at Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan politics and history and kind of the, the political stuff that doesn't get covered in the mainstream media. So um, things like land rights, things like um, you know, like a leftist perspective, perspective and like an anti-capitalist perspective on Saskatchewan. Something we direly need in Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With uh, good old, uh, I, I talk about him way more than I should, but John Gormley is like the the voice of Saskatchewan, right? And uh, it, it's awful. <laughs> so. It is. It's awful, and it's it's unfortunate um, because he's his perspective is is a really narrow one, um, and it's not even a particularly interesting one. I don't think. No, so it, no. it is unfortunate. <laughs> Just regurgitating the same uh, talking points that you could see on Fox News if you wanted to. 
<laughs> That's right. Or you know what? I could just get my uncle drunk and listen to him yell about those exact same things, and I wouldn't have That's to right. treat you poorly. <laughs> <laughs> And you might actually have a conversation with your uncle and not <laughs> instead of just having this guy on the radio. That's right. <laughs> so your show is Unmaking Saskatchewan. Yes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, was it Unmasking and I just read it wrong? <laughs> no, Unmaking. Okay. So uh, what is the what is the kind of the uh, impetus for the show and, and, and like what is the goal, I guess? So the show is something of a spite cast. Um, I <laughs> I came up with the idea of it when I was kind of angry about a lot of the discourse that was going on, uh, where people were talking about, you know, where we were in Saskatchewan, and they were talking about like a really narrow slice of time. So they were kind of talking about, you know, how we got here, and they're looking either back at, you know, the last 15 years under the Sask party, or they're looking back at maybe the last 40 years, you know, since Divine, and trying to figure out how did we get to this place where we are right now, uh, which is like a, a really dark period in Saskatchewan, which is a, a province that has had a lot of dark periods uh, where we have, you know, more than 200,000 people are living in poverty, uh, including children. We have uh, an outbreak of tuberculosis in the north while we're dealing with all of this, you know, COVID. Um, so there's like a lot of problems and then this persistent food insecurity, all of these things. And people really want to look at it as something that can be switched up with a new government, um, either mm -hmm. with getting the NDP elected or with building a new centrist party. And I really reject that idea. And I think that how we got here is um, a longer story than that. And I think that a lot of the problems that we have are rooted in, in history and that the way that this province was settled um, and the way that like and even before the settlement of this province. And so I want to go back to all of these things. So I want to go back to the early days of the fur trade. I want to go back to the early decision to settle this place as, um, you know, as an agrarian province. I want to look back at those things and see the way that they have impacted the way that we live our lives today. And the goal is kind of to show people that how we got here is this very long historical process. And so how we get away from here is also going to be a long historical process. And it's not going to be fixed with a new with another election. It, even if the NDP was completely uh, reformed and actually became a leftist party and actually won seats <laughs> and all of these things, like even in the most perfect circumstances in the next election, that's not going to fix these problems. And then I am also talking to folks um, so who are from Saskatchewan or people who are interested in um, like indigenous sovereignty and land rights and talk to them about ways that we can kind of restore a better balance than we have right now um, without relying on electoral politics and without relying on, you know, settler structures and settlers ways of doing and being. No, that sounds, uh, I, I noticed right away when I started listening to uh, your show that it has uh, like that solidly left uh, kind of analysis of things where you like, you don't just say, oh, well, it's because the NDP is in power. Or it's the conservatives in power or so on, so on and so forth. And even in your first episode, like you really attack, like you really look at the way that land ownership has developed kind of a lot of the ideas around Saskatchewan. And that really hit home to me about like a lot of the ways that I was raised in rural Saskatchewan and how uh, <laughs> land ownership was where your value came from. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really interesting the way that we have developed our, our concept of ourselves around land and property. And I said in that first episode that, um, you know, the way that we conceive of land is also the way that we conceive of freedom. And if you have property in Saskatchewan, if you own land and property, that is your freedom. Um, you 
it, white settlers anyways, <laughs> have the ability, um, if they own land and property, to do pretty much whatever they want with that land and property. Um, and sometimes that even includes murder, right? And, and there's a lot of violence and stuff like that that is attached to that. Whereas people who do not own land and property are really disenfranchised here. And um, another thing that was interesting, and I, I knew it going in, but I found out a lot more about it, about the way that women in particular were prevented from owning land during the early settlement of the province. Okay. Um, and it was like a deliberate attempt to prevent them from, you know, having any kind of independence and, and creating this dependency. And I think that we see that now where we have these really high rates of domestic and sexual violence in the province. And we have these really high rates of, of women just being completely disenfranchised from, you know, the economy and from politics. And I think that that's rooted in the way that we have developed this concept of land and, and who can have it and what they can do with it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I, <laughs> I always think of like, cause, the, I always wonder how one even owns land, but it's it's the system that's set up, right? It's it's always about the uh, people who already have power granting the right to land to people that give them money, I guess, is what it is. But it seems like nonsense to me, actually. <laughs> It, it is nonsense. Like the idea of owning land is is bizarre, right? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you really try and sit down and think about it and think about like carving up the the land and, and giving it to people and then like, what does it mean to own that land? Um, it, it's, it's bizarre <laughs> and it's violent, right? Like it's a really violent yeah, way to look yeah. at things, right? To, to own property um, and then to, to own that property and to do what you want on it. Um, it's, it's a really violent and antisocial way of, of living, I think. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, one of the things that I don't know, I, you might've mentioned it. Maybe I got this from your show was like, uh, if we take that, idea of land ownership as freedom and that's how you have value as a person and we transplant that into the modern state of things that's i see that on a daily basis when t people are talking about um like uh people with on social assistance or people who need help to survive homeless people like these are people who are quote unquote worthless according to the land owning people and it's yeah, like you say, like it's violent and it's it's in very harmful. Yeah, and I think that that you know when we think about owning land as having freedom, and then we think about that like the the inverse of that is that if you don't own land, you don't have freedom. And I think that that's really true when we look at the way that it is for people who are homeless um, or people who have really unstable housing. They don't have a lot of freedom. Right. Like their their right. movements are patrolled. Their ability to be in public is policed. Their ability to move around in the world is policed. Right. So I think that it's a, a really good way of looking at land ownership to, to think of it as freedom and that if you own it, you've got it. And if you don't, you are really subject to a police state. Yeah. And even uh, even as a renter, like we're limited in our freedom to do what we want with the people place that we live. We, we're limited. <laughs> like in so many ways, we're subject to the system as it's imposed on us, not as we wish to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about that a lot. I mean, I'm a renter and at any time my landlord could decide to sell the building that I live in. Right. Like, and then you have no recourse on that. Like there's, there's nothing <laughs> yeah. that you can do. Right. It, you can't be like, well, I pay rent on here. I should be able to stay like there there's um, it, yeah. You, you really lose a lot of your ability to, to make your own choices when you don't own your own property. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So I guess the second episode of your show, you talk about uh, like the hunger strategy and how uh, hunger is used as a tool to like control people, basically. Uh, so I wonder if you can elaborate on that a little bit for us. Yeah. So in uh, like I went way back uh, on that one, <laughs> to, like the, the 1700s. So the early days of like in, in the fur trade in the area that is now known as Saskatchewan. And at the time, um, the Hudson Bay Company basically owned the people who worked here. Like they, if you were a fur trader here, you didn't really have a lot of autonomy. You were really dependent on 
uh, the company and the food that the company provided you and all of these things. And they didn't provide adequate food. People did starve to death out here. You know, like they would send people over to do work and they would starve over the winter because there wasn't enough food provided for them. Um, and it wasn't necessarily because there wasn't enough food, like officers ate much better than workers did and all of these things, right? Like, so it was a strategy where the company looked and they were like, okay, we will send these people over and we will give X amount of food. And if that amount of food is not enough food, they'll die. And that's fine. Like that was a calculation that was deliberately made. Uh, and then later on um, in the 1800s, when the Canadian government decided that this area could support a large agrarian population and that it would be a place that would be, you know, farmland, they began to really starve out Indigenous people that lived here. And I mean, that was happening all along, right? Like the, yeah. the um, bison population was decimated for a deliberate reason to create hunger. But they realized, like the Canadian government and, and John A. Macdonald's government in particular, realized very quickly that if you starve people, you can get them to do what you want. Like you can get them to sign treaties that they wouldn't otherwise sign. You can get them to move to places that they wouldn't otherwise move, right? Like if you yeah. make people hungry, if you make their families hungry, you can get them to do a lot of things. And so it was realized really early on that hunger was a way to get people to do what you want. And it was a way to prevent them from resisting. And so now, like we have really like catastrophic rates of hunger here and like really high poverty, like the child poverty rate yeah. in Saskatchewan is more than a quarter, like more than a quarter of kids in this <laughs> province are living yeah. in poverty. And in some ridings, uh, more than half of kids are living in poverty, right? And so that is a way of like really controlling people and controlling the population. Like hunger isn't something that happens by accident. It's something that you look and you're like, well, we can prevent people from resisting. If they're hungry, if they're tired, if they are constantly just trying to get by and survive, we can get what we want and we can maintain our hold on power. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, it, it's, it has been throughout all of Canada's history in a sense, right? Like that's just the way we controlled people. And, uh, I say we, but I, I guess because I am a, a descendant of colonizers, so I want to make sure that I'm clear, clear on that. <laughs> like I'm not a member of an indigenous community. Um, but it's still used against even like workers and such, like as a way to control, uh, people who came here. And then just to, again, feed the profit machine and feed the system, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, conditions were horrendous for settlers as well. Like um, early settlers, like workers, um, it, it, it was it was horrible. Like they were paid appalling uh, amounts of money. They were living in like really squalid conditions in these rooming houses for like most of Saskatchewan's history, right? Like they're... There is not, um, there, there's always been a small group of people who have managed to do well here. And then like the majority of people have been really badly exploited. And something that I, I really want to show with the, the podcast is the ways that, you know, settlers, working class settlers and indigenous people are exploited. They share many similarities. And I really need settlers to become aware of that in a way <laughs> that makes them behave in, in different ways because right now the, the province really benefits and, and Canada itself really benefits from this idea that it's settlers versus Indigenous people um, true, and, true. and that one group is being harmed because the other group is being like, you know, benefiting. <laughs> and there's a lot of settlers who are not really benefiting in in incredible way, like in, in important ways. Um and that's not to say that settlers aren't violent. It's not to say that working set class settlers aren't responsible for the way right. that they are, like they really are. But there are so many similarities between the, the two groups. And if settlers could understand that Indigenous freedom and Indigenous sovereignty creates more freedom for them and, and creates a better world for them, um, maybe they would actually be able to um, stop perpetuating these kinds of violences and stop upholding this violent state. That sort of that sort of brings us up to uh, the the most recent episode, which is a, a conversation about land back, and uh, I know the land back is misunderstood even on like widely on the left among uh, uh, white leftists, but also just in general, like people are very very concerned about uh, 
uh, being sent back to Europe or whatnot. <laughs> so what what is land back, uh, and how did the uh, most recent uh, episode explore that topic? Yeah, so I mean, land back is the concept of like it, it's. I said in the episode, it's very simple and it's very complex, right? Like it's the simple thing is that you give the land back, right? Like that the land needs to be restored to indigenous sovereignty and to the the natives, like the the indigenous groups that own like not own the land um but the indigenous groups that stewarded the land uh before and that that needs to be done not through like just you know the way that the the government will give you a reserve or the way that you know sometimes uh, a wealthy landed settler will be like well i'm going to give you back this land but also you have to do this on it right like it it has to unconditionally be restored to the the indigenous like nations that it belongs right. to and that it's so so like that's simple but the complicated thing is like how do you do that because settlers don't really own land like we talked about this right like land ownership <laughs> yeah. is not really like it's not really a thing like the state owns the land so how do you really like restore these kinds of things and it, it's complicated and so i talked with my gold hawk about it mike has written a lot about capitalism about land back uh, about these kinds of things and we we talked about the ways that um land is is a social relationship and the way that you need to like and and I didn't understand this when I went into the conversation with Mike but that the capitalist relationship that we have with land right now and like property ownership and and the way that you can buy a plot of land and the way that you can own the minerals on that land and all of these things that's a social relationship too right like that is it, it's not a a positive social relationship but it is a <laughs> right. social relationship and so part of it is is trying to change our mindsets in the way that we understand what land is and the way that we understand our responsibility to land. And something that I, I think about Saskatchewan is that we don't, like settlers don't feel a obligation to the land. They don't feel a responsibility to the land. They don't feel, you know, the land is supposed to be responsible to you, right? The land is supposed yeah. to produce. The land is supposed to create profit for you. The land is supposed to do these things for you. And so part of land back as well is like changing that understanding and changing that relationship with the land and the way that you view it and understanding that land is a relation. And it is you, you have it, there needs to be reciprocity, right? Like you need to right. do things for the land and then the land will do things for you and and you have like this this symbiotic relationship with it which we don't have right now and that causes us a lot of harm yeah that's yeah. uh like listening to uh a bunch i listen to a variety of indigenous uh podcasts and youtube channels uh because i think we all should <laughs> but yeah <laughs> The, that's that seems to be uh, something that I've had I've actually struggled with is learning about that uh, reciprocity that viewing nature as a relation and trying to uh, feed back into it as much as it gives to you and like instead of this extractive way of view, viewing it like I grew up on a farm so I mean I, in a sense I understand that we're worried about the nutrients in the ground and we're worried, but only in so much as we can get our growth out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. instead of yeah. actually desiring to feed back into it. Well, and, and we've already had catastrophes because of that, right? Like the, the, the great depression was a problem, you know, like it was, it was a worldwide global recession and it was a drought, but a huge part of it was because of the farming practices, because of the way that we related to the land and the way that we tried to impose this European style of farming onto the land. And it, it cost people their lives. Like it, it, it stunted children's growth. Like it, it, had implications that we are still facing today right and we didn't For learn sure. <laughs> we didn't learn um <laughs> how to do better with it right so there's a cost like it's not just a cost to the land when we don't have that that positive relationship it's a cost to us like we pay the price for the relationship that we have with the land yeah like uh even like we didn't learn anything except how to uh take like we learned how to do science so that we could Force, force the land to do things it wasn't naturally going to do. 
<laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And I think that it's it, like, obviously, part of the reason that Saskatchewan is the world's largest potash producer is because we have a lot of potash. But I think that it's really interesting that this province that has been really committed to like forcing the land to grow things that it wasn't meant to grow or forcing it to grow things in periods of time that, you know, it was not prepared to do that. I think it's really interesting that this is a place that creates a product that force feeds growth. Yep, for yep. sure. It, it's uh, almost symbiotic. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I guess what's upcoming still for the podcast? Yeah. So the next episode that I'm working on um, is about sexual and domestic violence in the province, uh, because I think that it's it's a crisis. It's a huge, huge, huge problem. And it's a problem that intersects in a lot of different ways. I mean, we have like historically, like I said, like settler women were not allowed to own land when they first got here. Um, and that was something that was very different from the way that the United States was set settled, where women were allowed to homestead and encouraged to homestead. So, you know, settler women could not own property. Um, indigenous women were like right from the beginning when this land was like first settled. Um, they used like the settlers used hunger in order to sexually exploit indigenous women. So we're seeing these things now, right? Like we still see these kinds of things where women are largely disenfranchised. Women experience a lot of violence. Women experience a lot of sexual violence. So there's that historical aspect to it. And then there's all of these other contemporary things too, where like we have more sexual and domestic violence because women can't get out of their communities because there's no bus service because people right. are isolated in their communities. Um, we have these things because of the way that the police are like the, you know, so it's, I think an important topic because it shows the way that all of these different aspects of um, Saskatchewan's history and Saskatchewan's present and the way that we, we view transportation and the way that we view housing and all of these things all come together and converge to create this crisis that leads to, to women and gender variant people and children being murdered, right? Like it, it's, it's really catastrophic. And so that's going to be the next episode. Uh, but we're also going to talk about things like alcoholism um, and like drinking and driving is, is a crisis. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's a, like, a, a lot of historical reasons for that. And, yeah. and I think that we need to kind of explore that because drinking and driving here is it's a problem and yet it's not a problem right like it's it's a problem that harms people <laughs> it's a problem that kills people but it's not a problem that is going to keep you from being elected to yeah. uh the premier <laughs> yeah that's so right that's, and we're going to talk about labor and and all sorts of different things um that i think are really important to understand for us to understand how we get out of this mess yeah, the, the the drinking and driving thing. Like I, I've been talking about this for a few years actually, because uh, the laws on uh, cell phone use in the car uh, came through a few years ago, and and it's it's very cracked down on, and everybody's very uh, socially judgmental about it. And uh, but the rate of drunk driving has not gone down in Saskatchewan in probably thirty years. Like it's still at that <laughs> the same rate. Where every, everywhere else in Canada, the rate continues to go down. <laughs> Saskatchewan always stays the same. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Something I found really frustrating was recently uh, what we assume is the premier's kid, who is 28 years old, uh, was caught driving his dad's truck drunk in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, and the car was impounded. And I found it really aggravating that a lot of the discourse uh, on Twitter was people saying, well, kids need to, we should just leave the kids alone. <laughs> and, and, you know, like we, you wouldn't want your own kid's name to be splashed all over the news and like all of these things. And this is a private family issue. And I'm like, it's not a private family issue. This is a, like the son of a man who killed somebody with his vehicle and has a history of driving drunk. And like Scott Moe was not able to like convince his kid that drinking and driving has like consequences and driving recklessly has consequences. And then this kid goes to law school, law yeah. school in <laughs> Vancouver and then gets caught driving drunk. And we're not supposed to talk about that. Like we're supposed to let that slide. And frankly, I'm 28 isn't a kid. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, an adult, like a full blown adult. You are not a youth yeah. anymore. Like you, you should know better. And I think that the reason that the conversation went that way is in part because a lot of people have a personal stake in making sure that drinking and driving isn't stigmatized because yep. they drink yep. and drive or people they love drink and drive. Um, and they feel very protective of people who drink and drive because it's it's part of the culture and um i think that that's a huge problem it is yeah indeed i even like obviously i grew up uh in the 90s drinking and driving was a thing you grew up in a rural area and and i don't know that that's changed any is the thing like (laughs) like 30 years ago, it was the thing that we did when we were teenagers and we were just partying and whatever. And I don't think anything's different. Well, one thing I do when I meet people from other places is I'm like, so do you guys have road pops? Is road pops a thing? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, do you, like, is drinking and driving not just something that people do because they feel like they want to get from point A to point B and they they don't want to. But it's literally a pastime that you. (laughs) Pastime, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, other places don't seem to get it the same way. Maybe in rural areas, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're coming up on uh, almost 30 minutes, so we'll go into, I think, po- counter-propaganda if you want. Sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, for this, for uh, you've got... Uh, people have cultivated a really narrow view of what needs to be done to change the province. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, And I think that that has to do like a lot with the way that media presents things and a lot of the way that like the the governing parties and the opposition party present things that we have like this really limited vision for what Saskatchewan can be. Um, And we're constantly being expected to like adjust our expectations and adjust our expectations downward. So like instead of being able to (laughs) talk about like non-market housing and like free housing, we have to talk about like, well, maybe we could like cap rent at like X amount and and do these things. Right. Like we're, we're, we're expected to have this really limited vision for what this province could be. And I think that one of the things that we need to do, like as people who are on the left and people who have like a a stronger vision of society is to put out like concrete ideas of what the province could actually look like. And Sask Forward has done this. Like they've got a really great, I think it's like a six or seven minute long video where they talk about where they imagine a future. Like they imagine Saskatchewan 10 years from now, um, how it could look if we actually like took action on climate and we took action on transit and we took action on all of these things. But for the most part, that vision is not out there. And so we really have like a responsibility, I think, to not just say that things could be better, but to talk about like concretely, what would it look like for the province to be better? Because otherwise, like we're just treading water and barely treading water. I wonder, uh, sometimes I, uh, I kind of, I get the impression that we are uh, still, we carry over our, our football things into real life and we become next year land like every year nothing changes and we continually go oh well we'll work on that later we'll, we'll try and make some changes and we'll do better next time and and like yeah i don't know it seems like it's really hard to get people to use their imagination in any kind of looking forward as uh the future yeah, I was I was in this it was like a, a meeting, like it was like one of those Twitter spaces or whatever um, with Saskatchewan leftists and people were talking about like what what we need to do and what needs to come next. And it, it, this like kept coming up where people were like, well, the NDP needs to rebrand. And I'm like, that's not what we need like it, you don't just need to like slap a new bumper sticker on it and change the name and recreate this other party um like it needs to be like an actual change like there needs to be like concrete changes that we yeah. can make um but people's vision is just so limited um to this idea that what we need is like a rebrand rebrand or a new centrist party which we already have three centrist parties we have a green party we have a liberal party we have the ndp party we don't need another centrist party in, in the <laughs> yeah although to be fair the liberal party i think only has one member 
<laughs> yeah, Jeff is out there though. He's talking <laughs> <laughs> them up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I, I, I always, I used to say this about the U.S. elections too, like, uh, and federally, like it's always the slightly more left party pulling to the center, the the center party pulling to the right, and the right just going, ah, we're over here doing whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that the one of the big problems is, is that like centrists themselves tend to think that like their ideas are the most rational and therefore the majority yeah. of people are centrists. And so therefore people should cater to them. But everybody thinks that their <laughs> ideas are the most rational. So I don't yeah. hold the beliefs that I do because I think they're irrational beliefs. Right. Um, yeah. And so but we keep catering to this group that that tends to think that it's being the most reasonable and that it's being the, the most um pragmatic and that's not really true like it's not pragmatic to hang out in the center it's not pragmatic no. to to move yourself to the right like that's not actually pragmatic and we see that because the NDP cannot win like they can't win with this yeah. this centrism right but the lessons just don't get learned yeah it's it's uninspiring and and that's for people that are even still invested in electoral politics like a lot <laughs> of us are like well we got to do something else because this just doesn't work <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we've got to work around it. Right. Yeah. But the yeah, the people who are still invested in in electoral politics are are really, I think. Um, and some of them are like people that I really admire and they have, you know, thoughts and and um, like principles that I really admire. And they're still pushing on the the government and they're still pushing on, like, you know, getting the NDP elected. And I think that it's a really big waste of their resources and their energies. And I think that those things should be spent outside of the NDP and outside of electoral politics. Yeah, for sure. I, it's, it's, it's weird because part of me want, I guess I'm used to electoral politics, right? Like, so then I'm like, yeah, okay, well, I just want to see somebody inspiring come out of the NDP and like somebody with a real vision for the future. And then I'm also just like, well, let's, we have to do something else because even if they have somebody who's inspiring, like say, say even if somebody really is inspired by Carla Beck, then, (laughs) then it's hard to imagine, even if the NDP wins, that anything is ever going to change. So. Well, that's the thing, right, is that like the problem, like the NDP is a tar pit. <laughs> and even <laughs> if you do get like a really bold, visionary leader, um, that leader only has so much power, right? Like they're, yeah. you know, to, to change things and, and direct things. And I think that the more likely outcome is even if you got like a real radical somehow managed to win that leadership, <laughs> um, they're they're going to be hobbled. It's not going to be them pulling the NDP to the left. It's going to be the NDP corralling them into the center, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. No, I I have to agree. It's and not I'm I'm a pro labor guy. I'm a pro union guy. But a lot of the unions in Saskatchewan are still very conservative in a lot of ways. Right. And they're still very tied into business and money in a way that maybe isn't great for an actual radical (laughs) and they're the ones that have power in the NDP. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that looking to the NDP is maybe just not the way. And then like we see that federally too, right? Like they're, they're toothless parties now. And I think that the thing to do is, is to move away and to devote our energies into organizing outside of that. And a lot of people are like, and, and that's something that I think, um, people on the left in Saskatchewan don't get enough credit for is that there is like a core group of people. It's a small group of people, but there is a core group of people that are organizing and they're showing up and they're constantly showing up. And what they need is the energy <laughs> from the people who are are pouring it into the NDP. They need that energy and they need people to help them organize outside of these political structures. Yeah, for sure. I, I worry too, like uh, if say, uh, you get an outside group that's organizing a lot of times, not if somebody starts to rise and help that group actually gain ground, then the NDP or another political party will try and recruit them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. that's not Which good either. Like the worst thing that could possibly happen to a radical is to be <laughs> recruited by the NDP. Yeah. <laughs> not good. 
Well, so for uh, we'll move on to foes and comrades. And you didn't have any foes, but for comrades, you wanted to talk about uh, community fridges and the people that are uh, uh, keeping them up. Yeah, there are a lot of foes. I couldn't really pick one. Um, <laughs> but I think that the people who are organizing like the community fridges are really like symbolic like emblematic of what i'm talking about when i talk about working outside of the the organized structures of, of politics in the province because these are people who are um you know especially like the cathedral fridge in regina like these are people who are refusing to work with um like within the the organization that we have now and they're like we need to feed people and this is how we're going to do it and mm. they just do it right and they're not going for government grants and they're not trying to work within the system that has continually failed us they are like how do we get people food and and keep people fed and i think um one of the things one of the last stories that i wrote uh when i was working for the sas dispatch as the editor of the sas dispatch was about the cathedral community fridge and it talked um, the my interviewee talked a lot about um, how the food bank is really not a, a way of keeping people fed. It's a way of saying that there's access to food, um, like there's food there, but it really prevents people like if you don't have uh, an address, if you don't have like a, um, a residence, if you don't have all of these kinds of things, if you don't have like ID for every member of your household, if you don't have all of this stuff, you can only get one emergency hamper and then you don't get anything from the food bank, right? And the food bank operates on these bizarre hours, like 9 to 11.30 a.m. and then 1 to 3.30 p.m. Like, so right. work hours and it's way out in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, it's not a way of keeping people fed and the food that they give you is not necessarily culturally appropriate and all these things whereas people who are working with the community fridge are like we need to not just make sure that there's food available but that people can actually cook and eat the food that they're getting right and yeah. i think that that's huge and i think that that's something that you get when you work outside of these structures is that you come to an understanding that it is not just enough to say that there is there's food available it's not just enough to say that there's housing available it's not just enough to say that these things there you have access to these things it's getting people these things like making sure that they are actually housed, making sure that they're actually fed, right? And we talk a lot in um, politics and, and in the existing power structures about, you know, um, availability and, mm. and making sure that these things are available. Well, if things are available, but I don't know how to access them, or if like there's food there, but it's a six pound bag of lentils, and I have no idea how to cook lentils, like that's not, uh, like, yeah, it's available, but it doesn't mean that I can use it. It doesn't mean that it is um, helpful to me, right? And so I think that people like the community fridge workers um, and, and volunteers are people who recognize that, that it's not just enough to say that this exists. You have to get it to people. Yeah, for sure. I With, uh, with the food banks, I always, I don't know. I thought I just read something the other day that said like you had to, uh, in some cases, prove that your income was below a certain threshold as well. So now they're, so they're also means testing people who are coming to the food bank. Nobody's going to the food bank unless they need it. Like, no, no. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they, they are, they're means testing it. And like, and the thing about the food bank that drives me crazy is it's not their food. Like, it's not like the food bank owns that food. Like, people have donated that food. It's not theirs yeah. to gatekeep. And yet they're still gatekeeping who gets it. And it's a really controlling and, and violent kind of organization that, that does that. And that prevents people from getting food unless they are willing to lay out their entire life for them. Um, it, it's really yeah. disturbing, I think. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a fan of the idea of, <laughs> of that. That's I, I I guess I don't want to denigrate like any workers like, like if they're doing like doing good work, people are are doing what they can or what they imagine they can, I suppose, but uh again, it's it's a systemic thing. It seems like we need to think outside of the box. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, if you if you think about it, like the people who need the food the most, like the people that are hungriest are often pr- people who are like rural. So they're not even living in areas where there is a food bank. Yeah. They're people who don't have transportation, so they can't get to the place where the food bank is. They're people who don't have addresses because they're unhoused. They're people who, who don't have all of the things that the food bank requires of them. Like they don't have a, a bank account. Because, you know, like for whatever reason, they can't get a bank account. So they can't give you you, like they can't prove to you that they're poor because they're so poor. (laughs) They can't prove that they're poor enough for you. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. So all of these like hurdles that you have to jump over really prevent like the people who need it most from from getting it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot that needs to be fixed in our province. And uh, I'm a little bit heartened by the fact that I've seen. Uh, a lot more activity, uh, both in media and outside of media, with uh, just more people who are seeing the problems and actually analyzing them and 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 working to fix them. Yeah, and there are there are like there's a lot of really cool conversations that are happening right now, and there's there's a lot of like there are podcasts that have popped up with people who are talking about Saskatchewan in a really like frank and honest way, and there are people who are having these discussions, and like even the discussion that I was in that I was like so disappointed by with people talking about rebranding. It's at least it's people trying to figure out how we get out of this, right? And you've right. got to start somewhere. So I I do find that heartening, and I I do find like the the organization that goes on um, around like COVID protocols like around getting like you know in schools and and all of these things like I think that that's valuable um and there are times that you know like I city hall in Regina has come out and, and people have said things that are really important and done things that are really important um so I I do think that not there Tarina is, Shaw though <laughs> not Tarina Shaw no oh god, oh, god. yeah talk about being on fit to serve um yes so yeah i know um there there are definitely like there's definitely progress that's being made um but it's like really incremental because there's just not enough power behind it yeah 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 and i don't know i, I we started me and david started uh our, our saskatchewan podcast in uh, i guess it's over a year to go now a year and a half ish now and at that time i didn't know of any other Saskatchewan criticism, you know, or, or leftist kind of progressive views of things. And since then, it seems like there's at least there's a lot more stuff coming out. And uh, maybe John Gormley isn't the only voice in Saskatchewan these days. Yeah. And I think that that's huge, right? Because he he really was for the longest time. Um, him and like Mandrick are the people that we're hearing from. Um, so these two white guys who are like very financially secure, um, and, you know, have like secure jobs and, and stable housing and, and all of these things are, are the ones that we're getting the majority of our opinions from. And that's like really dark, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, and it, I think like it harms the discourse. And so I think having other voices come in and be part of the discourse and like gain that power and, and tell these stories, I think is huge. For sure. For sure. Well, is there anything else you want to cover before uh, I get you to plug your stuff? No, I think that that's everything. Yeah, um, it's been great talking with you. For sure. So where can people find your uh, content and uh, any other stuff from uh, that you want to plug? Yeah, um, well, they can find me on Twitter. I'm at Berlios, B-I-R-L-I-O-S on Twitter. Um, mostly shit posts, so don't come for like <laughs> important stuff. <laughs> um, my, my journalism can be found at Sask Dispatch, uh, Briar Patch, and Passage, and Media Co-op, um, as well as the University of Regina Carillon. And uh, my show um, is, you can find the, the link in bio um, on my Twitter, and maybe you can throw up a link to it as well sure. um, with the show. That would be great. For sure. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. 
If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>